I'm Michaela Peterson, Jordan's daughter. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's called Jacob's Ladder. Last Tuesday, my dad came on my podcast and talked about what the last year has been like. He hasn't done something for YouTube in almost a year. If you haven't seen it, look up the Michaela Peterson podcast on YouTube, and he's the most recent episode. Or if you want an audio version, look up the Michaela Peterson podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. It was tough. It wasn't an easy conversation. The last year has been hell, but we finally got some help. I hope the podcast stops other people from experiencing the horrors that my dad has had to experience this year. Enjoy the episode. Sleep is one of the most important things we can do for our health. My family and I are in Serbia right now, and the time change has been absolutely brutal. I can't think very well if I don't get enough sleep. Neither can anyone, really. Apparently, a lack of sleep is equivalent in brain toxicity to alcohol. So I've made it a goal to increase my sleep quality while I'm here, and I'm really missing my Helix sleep mattress. Helix is rated the number one mattress by GQ and Wired, and CNN called it the most comfortable mattress they've ever slept on. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Jordan, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders at helixsleep.com slash Jordan. Get up to $200 off at helixsleep.com slash Jordan. helixsleep.com slash Jordan. Season 3, Episode 13, Jacob's Ladder, a Jordan B. Peterson Lecture. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you very much for showing up again. That's uh, really good to see everybody here. So, one of the things that I've been realizing as a consequence of going through these stories is that the degree to which they're about individuals is quite remarkable. And I think that's really telling. One of the reasons I prefer Dostoevsky to Tolstoy is because Tolstoy is more of a sociologist. He's more interested in the relationship between groups of people. This is an oversimplification because obviously Tolstoy is a great author, but I like Dostoevsky better because he really delves into the souls of individuals, and I think it's remarkable the degree to which all of the stories that we've covered so far in Genesis are about individuals, and they're quite realistic, which is quite remarkable too. They're not really romanticized to any great degree because all of the people that are regarded, as, regarded, let's say, as patriarchal or matriarchal figures in Genesis have no shortage of ethical, diff, no shortage of ethical flaws and also no shortage of difficulties in their life. And the difficulties are realistic. They're, they're major league problems, you know, like familial catastrophes and famine and war and revenge and hatred and all those things it's not a it's not a pretty it's not a pretty book and that's one of the things that makes it great i mean that's one of the things that characterizes great literature right is that it it doesn't present you with a whitewashed view of 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 humanity or of existence and that's really a relief i think because as you all know because you're alive there's no such thing as a whitewashed existence like you're to be alive is to be in trouble uh, ethically and existentially. I've been reading this book recently. I'll talk about it a little bit later. It's called Better Never to Have Been. And it was written by a philosopher in South Africa, in Cape Town, named Benatar. That's his last name. And he basically argues, I think it's a specious argument, and I, I think it's artificially constructed. But he basically argues that because life is so full of suffering, even good lives are very much full of suffering, that it's wrong to bring children into the world because the suffering outweighs the good, even in good lives. And it's actually wrong. It would also be better not to exist for exactly the same reason. And my sense in reading the book is that he came to that conclusion and then wrote the book to justify it, which is actually the reverse of the way that you should write a book. What you should do when you're writing a book is you should have a question. And you should, it should be a real question, right? It should be one you don't know the answer to. 
And then you should be studying and writing like mad and reading everything you can get your hands on to see if you can actually grapple with the problem and come to some solution. And, and you should walk the reader as well through your process of thinking so that they can come to the, well, not necessarily to the same conclusion, but at least track what you're doing. And I don't think that's what he did. I think he wrote it backwards. But then, and, I, and so I was thinking about it a lot because that's actually a question that I've contended with in my writing. There are Mephistophelian or satanic figures, for example, in Goethe's Faust, um, and also Ivan in, in, the, in the Brothers Karamazov, who basically make the same case, you know, that existence is so rife with trouble and suffering that it would be better if it didn't exist at all. And the problem I've had with that, I, there's a variety of them, but one of the problems I've had with that is what happens if you start to think that way, because what I've observed is that people who begin to think that way, that isn't where they stop. Like, they get angry at existence, which is what happened to Cain, as we saw in the Cain and Abel story, and then the next step is to start taking revenge against existence, and that cascades until it's revenge against, well, I think the best way of thinking about it is revenge against God for the crime of being, which is, I think, the deepest sort of hatred that you can entertain. And, 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 and when you're in the grip of a really deep emotion, like a really profound emotion, right at the bottom of emotions, you're in something that's like a quasi-religious state, and that's more or less independent of your belief, say, in a transcendent deity. I mean, you can be in a profoundly emotional state that's as deep as it can be, and it can have religious significance without that necessarily signifying anything about a transcendent being, you know. But, but then I was thinking, you see, the problem with that argument is you can gerrymander it endlessly, you know, because First of all, how do you measure suffering and how do you measure happiness? It's like, how do you assign weights to them? And God, There's just no way of doing that. You have to do it arbitrarily. And so you can make an argument that the suffering outweighs the happiness. You just weight the suffering more heavily than you weight the happiness, and that's the end of that, you know? And so that's, that's a problem. But I think there's a deeper problem. And I was reading this other book a while back as well, which was written by the guy who... Uh, ran the Human Genome Project, and I don't remember exactly what it was called, but it was something like a scientist's case for God, or something like that. And one of the things he referred to, which didn't strike me as hard as it should have to begin with, was the, he, he, he thought that one of the phenomena, say, that justified a belief in a transcendent being was something like the moral intuition of human beings, that, you know, we have a sense of right and wrong, and... Uh, you know, it's certainly in what happens in Genesis in the story of Adam and Eve is that 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 story announces the coming of the sense of right and wrong, right? The knowledge of good and evil. And it isn't something we ascribe to animals. It's something that's unique to human beings. Animals can be predators and, you know, and they can be gentle and, and you can have a relationship with them. But you never think of an evil cat or, you know, or an evil wolf, even though they're, you know, they're predatory. Um, but human beings, we have this capacity to judge between good and evil, right and wrong. And it's really an integral part of our, our being. And I think you can make an evolutionary case for that, a biological case for that, as you can make a biological case for most of what is relevant about human beings because we're biological creatures. But we don't really understand the significance of that. Like, what happens in the story of Adam and Eve is that that's, that realization, that coming to the knowledge of good and evil, is actually represented as a shift of cosmic significance, right? It puts, a, it puts a permanent fracture in the structure of being. And, you know, if you think of human beings as insignificant ants on a tiny dust moat in the middle of an infinite cosmos, a, a cosmos that cares less for us, then who cares fundamentally if human beings have the knowledge to distinguish between good and evil. But if you give consciousness a central role in being, and you can make a perfectly reasonable case for that, because without consciousness, there's no being, as far as anyone can determine. So it may be much more central than we think. And, and, and I, I really don't think there's a counter-argument to that. Like, not a solid one. You can state that consciousness is epiphenomenal and, and that the world is fundamentally materialistic and it doesn't matter that there's consciousness. You can state that, but you can make an equally credible case the other way. And certainly our lived experience is that consciousness is crucial, obviously, and we treat each other as if most of the time we're valuable conscious beings. And 
Uh, we wouldn't give up our consciousness, even though it's often consciousness of suffering. And so then I think another problem with the book is that it's, it's sort of predicated on the idea that life is for happiness. And I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's how people experience life, and I might be wrong, but it seems to me that people experience life as something like a, a series of crucial ethical decisions. It's something like that. I mean, when I, I just can't imagine, and maybe I'm being naive about this, but I can't imagine that, I can't imagine another being that's like me in, in, in most senses that isn't constantly wrestling in some sense with what the next proper thing to do is. It's not like it's obvious. It's not bloody obvious. And it, it, it doesn't mean you'll do the right thing, because you don't lot, lots of times. And you know that by your own judgment, right? Because you're making mistakes all the time. Sometimes you don't know what you're doing, and maybe it's a mistake, and maybe it isn't. And who's to say? But that isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you know that what you're doing is wrong, and you go ahead and do it anyways. People do that all the time. And that's also extremely peculiar. You bloody well think that if you knew it was wrong, and you told yourself that it was wrong, that that would be sufficient, so that you just wouldn't do it, but that isn't what you're like at all, you know, and you can tell yourself something is wrong 50 times, and you'll do it the 51st time, and then you'll feel, you know, like, like you deserve to feel, probably, and, but it doesn't stop you, and so, so then I think the other problem with the, the viewpoint, the idea that the suffering of life eradicates its utility, is that it's predicated on the idea that happiness or lack of suffering even, is, is the right criteria by which to judge life. And I don't think that's how we actually experience life. I think what we do instead is put ourselves through a series of excruciating moral choices. You know, and one of the things that, that's really significant about the biblical stories, and I, I think about the, the entire implicit philosophy, you know, that's embedded in the stories, is that... That's how life is presented in, in the stories, is all of these individuals, first they're individuals, they're not groups, and second, they're agonizing over their moral choices all the time, all the time. And they have a relationship with God, and, but it's not, a, it's not a directive relationship exactly. Even the people to whom God speaks directly, which I suspect is not something you'd exactly want to have happen, is, it, it, it's... They're still, the, the, even the fact that they have a direct relationship with God doesn't stop them from being tormented continually by their moral choices. And so the world is presented as a, a moral landscape, not as a, not as a place that justifies itself by happiness. It's presented as a moral landscape, and people are presented as creatures who traverse through the moral landscape making ethical decisions that determine the course of the world. And that seems to me to be right, and that's not, a, that's not the same as happiness by any stretch of the imagination. It's a whole different category of being. And, you know, and then I've thought that through a lot, and I think, well, we do make choices, and what we do is contend with the future, you know, and that the future seems to appear to us as a realm of possibility. It, 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 that's a more accurate way of thinking about it than, than that the future presents itself to, it, to us as a realm of determined things. It it's presents itself as a realm of possibility, and there's good choices in that realm, and there's poor choices, or even evil choices in that realm. And we're negotiating continually, deciding which of those choices we're going to bring into being. That seems to me to be phenomenologically indisputable, and we certainly treat each other as if that's what we're doing, because we hold each other responsible for our actions, you know, with some exceptions. And that we're deciding each moment whether to make things better or worse. And that seems to me to be correct. And I think that that's what these stories illustrate. They don't say that directly, you know, although I think it gets more and more explicit as the narrative unfolds. But, and then part of the realism of the stories is that the, the people aren't, the people that are being presented are by no means good. I mean, maybe with the exception of Noah. Noah seemed to be a pretty good guy. They did, he did get drunk and, you know, and, and, and end up naked, exposed to his sons and so forth. And, but, I mean, 
he, he isn't talked about a lot as a character. It's a pretty compressed story. But Abraham, I mean, Abraham had plenty of problems, not least of which was in his inability to leave home. And then, you know, his lying about his wife. And there, there's all sorts of mistakes. And then Jacob, who we're going to talk about tonight, is an even more morally ambivalent character. He's, especially at the beginning of the story, he's, it's, it's, <laughs> He isn't the sort of person that you would pick out, especially if you were a hack writer. You wouldn't pick him out as the hero of the story. He does a lot of things that are really pretty reprehensible and takes him an awful long time to learn better. And yet he's the person who's put forward as the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's from this flawed person that the people that, that maybe that, whose story you might say is at the fundamental constitutes the fundamental underpinning of our culture. It's, it's from this deeply flawed individual that that group emerges. And so you might think of that as a relief, too, because, you know, you're no knight in shining armor, you know, with, with, a, with a pure moral past. I mean, people make mistakes of catastrophic proportions nonstop, you know. And that also means that these stories put forward something approximating hope, because in their realism, in their moral realism, they present heroes, I suppose, the heroes of renown, right? The patriarchs of old, let's say, who are realistic people who have fits of anger and rage and who are murderous at times and who are deeply, deeply uh, embroiled with family dispute and, and who, who have adulterous affairs and, and like they do all the terrible things that people do. And the weird thing is, is that God is still with them. And, you know, it isn't obvious what that means, or even if it means anything, but it's very, it's not disputable as far as I can tell that, A, we're conscious, and that consciousness is a transcendent phenomena, which, which we do not understand, and that the landscape that we traverse through is moral. Like every story you ever watch, anything that grips your imagination on the screen or in the theater, or like any story that grabs you, is a story of moral striving. It's, it's, it's just not interesting otherwise. Right? The person has to be confronted with complex moral choices, and then you see the outcome. And you know, the good guy does it right, and the bad guy does it badly, and things don't go so well for the bad guy, generally. And if it's a bit more sophisticated, the good and the bad are in the same individual, and that's, you know, that's a more compelling story. But So we could say, well, let, let's, we could make the assumption that it might be worthwhile thinking of the world as a as it has been thought of classically, as a theater upon which the forces of good and evil continually strive for dominance. And I, for the life of me, especially after I started reading deeply into 20th century history and all the terrible things that happened in the 20th century, and all the terrible, unbelievably incomprehensible things that people did to one another, I just couldn't see seeing things any other way as realistic. You know, because I don't think that you can immerse yourself in 20th century history without coming to the conclusion that evil is a reality. And if it's a reality, it depends on what you mean by reality, but it's a fundamental enough reality for me. And if it's a reality, then I don't see how you can escape from the conclusion that the cosmos, as we experience it at least, is a, a place of moral striving. And... Well, that's one of the things that's really illustrated in the story of Jacob, and, and I found that quite striking. So, so the last time, last lecture, I ended with the Abrahamic stories, with the death of Sarah, and that was Abraham's wife. And so we're going to continue from, from there. Remember, Abraham had a son, Isaac, and... He was asked by God to sacrifice his son, which we talked about in, in some depth. And I was attempting to make the case that, you know, the idea of sacrifice was one of humankind's great discoveries because it meant the discovery of the future, essentially, but it also meant the discovery that the future was something that you could make a bargain with and that you could give up something now, something impulsive, some pleasure, even a deep pleasure in the moment, and you could strive 
and hypothetically you could make a covenant, a bargain with the future, and if your sacrifices were acceptable, and that seemed to mean ethically acceptable, you had to sacrifice the right thing, that that vastly increased the probability that not only you would be successful, let's say, but that your descendants would be too. And I don't think that that's an irrational proposition. I mean, you have to leaven it a bit with the realization that sometimes, you know, you get sliced off at the knees no matter what, right? Because life has an arbitrary element and, and that can't be tossed out. But building in the arbitrary element will say, you still want to think, well, what's your best bet given a certain amount of randomness? And it seems to me that conscious, self-aware sacrifice and proper ethical striving is your best bet. And, you know, there's another idea that, well, I've always explained it, when I've explained it to people, I've always used the movie Pinocchio as an example, you know, that when Geppetto is trying to make his puppet into a self-aware and autonomous moral agent, which is what he wants above all else, you know, he aims at the highest good that he can conceive, which, which is the star that he prays to, essentially, and hopes for the transformation. And there's also something in that that's unutterably profound. And maybe that is somewhat independent of the idea that you have to believe in God. I, I would also say that what it means to believe in God in the Old Testament is by no means clear. And that's something I also really want to talk about tonight. It's not obvious what it means. And, well, Geppetto... What he does, at least, is aim at the highest good of which he can conceive. You know, and, and that, that's actually been a philosophical definition of God upon occasion, that God is the highest good of which you conceive. And, you know, that's different than the idea of a transcendent being, precisely. But it's in line with, it's in line with certain interesting psychoanalytic speculations. This is one of the things I really liked about Carl Jung, you know, Jung was so radical a thinker, it's just beyond belief. Like, I've read a lot of critics of Jung, and I've always, I've always got a kick out of them, because the things they accuse Jung of are so trivial compared to the things that Jung actually did, that it's like accusing a, a murderer of jaywalking. Like, because Jung was unbelievably radical. Like, here's one of his ideas, you know. He thought that it was necessary. He, he believed that psychotherapy could be replaced by a supreme moral effort. And so the moral effort would be something like aiming at the good and then trying to integrate yourself around that. And that the, the good at which you aimed would be something approximating what you would be like if you manifested your full potential. And that you'd have a glimmering of what that full potential was. So that would be the potential future you. And he thought of that, he thought of people as four-dimensional entities, especially, essentially, that were stretched across time. And that you as a totality across time, including your potential, manifested yourself also in the here and now. And that part of what your potential manifested itself was something like the voice of conscious, conscience or intuition. It's an amazing idea. It's an amazing idea, right? Because it's like what you could be in the future beckons to you in the present and helps you determine the difference between good and evil. It's a mind-boggling idea. And, you know, I think that it's an idea you have to contend with. And then he, he went further than that, and this is, this is also a remarkable idea. You know, he, he was interested in the symbolic representation of Christ, and I mean, psychologically speaking, and he thought of Christ as the representation of the ideal potential human. It's something like that. So it was a symbolic, rep at, at minimum, that's what Christ was, is a symbolic representation of the ideal potential of a human being. And so for Jung, there was no difference between there was no psychological difference between who you could be in the future beckoning to you and the pre in the present and orienting yourself in relationship to Christ. Psychologically, those were the same thing. And then, so that's a pretty mind-boggling idea. Like, seriously, that's a mind-boggling idea. You know, especially when you add the psychological idea that the th one of the things that characterizes your ideal future self is the ability to make sacrifices, right? And the deeper the sacrifice, the better. And then also to recover from the sacrifice, right? So that's the death and rebirth. So the part of you that's most essential to your full flowering as a, as a being is your ability to let things go and then spring back from that. So to die in some sense and to be reborn in the service of a higher good. And then, well, then the next part of that is that 
the direction of the world depends on you doing that. So not only your own life, but your family's life. And, and because we're networked so intently together, you know, the, the whole panoply of humankind and maybe the structure of the, of the cosmos. And, you know, you might think, well, no, but, you know, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. First of all, one person can wreak an awful lot of havoc. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And as we get more technologically powerful, that becomes even more relevant and important and, and, and crucial. You know, one of the things that Jung said was that we had to wake up because we are too technologically powerful to be as morally asleep as we are. And that seems to me just to be self-evident. That's, yeah, for sure, that's true. We're, we're, we're half asleep with nuclear bombs. It's not a good idea. It's seriously not a good idea. And so, well, and then you might ask yourself too, you know, well, like, what is the ultimate potential of a fully developed human being? And, well, we certainly know that you have admiration for people who are more developed rather than less developed. That's, that just happens automatic, or resentment, that, but that's okay, it's the same thing, it doesn't matter. But it's not like you can't identify them. You can identify them, you know, and, and they're put forward to you in, in, in drama and fiction and all of that constantly. So that's another form of moral intuition. You know, you can, re- you can discern the wheat from the chaff, let's say. And, and so the other thing that I was thinking about that's worth consideration too is that, you know, and maybe this is, maybe this is petty, but I don't think it is. Somebody asked me the other day if I believed in miracles. And I hate being asked questions like that, you know. <laughs> and, you know, it's also people ask me, do I believe in God? And, I, like, I don't know what they mean when they say that, and so I don't know what to answer, because I don't think we're talk, necessarily going to talk about the same thing. But in any case, I said yes. And I have a variety of reasons for that. But one of them is that, you know, the consensus among physicists is that we can track the origin of the cosmos to something like a hundred millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. It's like, it's so close to the Big Bang that the difference is literally infinitesimal. But the consensus is that before that, whatever that is, the laws of physics themselves break down. Well, what, what do you call an event that exists outside the laws of physics? By definition, that's a miracle. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a transcendent deity that caused the event. That's a separate issue. But it does imply a barrier of some sort beyond which we can't go where some other set of rules apply. And so, I find that interesting as well. So, all right. So, Sarah dies, and Abraham makes a bargain with the Hittites to purchase a burial place for her and they offer it as a gift and he insists upon paying for it It's a little story that basically indicates two things that Abraham was the kind of guy that You trust pretty much when you see him and that even if something is offered to him as a gift He's going to do everything to Be reciprocal about it and and so it's not a massively important part of the story but it's it's in keeping with the same narrative flow and so Ephron, who's a Hittite, offers a burial place as a gift, and Abraham says, no, you know, you have to let me pay for it, and Ephron says he will, and and that works out very well, and so he has a good burial place for his wife. And then Abraham decides that Isaac needs a wife, and so he sends his eldest servant to Mesopotamia to find a wife for Isaac, and There's this strange ritual that's performed. So it says in the story that the servant places his hand under Abraham's thigh to to swear, but that isn't really what it means. It means that he places his hand... I don't know exactly how to say this properly. Well, use your imagination. How about that? And the idea is that, as far as I can tell, that He's swearing on the future. He's swearing on future people. It's something like that. So that, that's sort of what testify means, right? Think about the root. Well, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> that is what it... That's, that is the derivation, right? It, it is the derivation. So, so, uh, 
So anyways, this is a serious issue. And so that servant has to go and find Isaac a good wife. And he wants him to find Isaac a wife who is willing to accept the same fundamental belief system, which is something like the belief in a, a God that's a unity rather than a plurality. You know, the other thing that Jung was very insistent upon was that there was a relationship between polytheism and psychological confusion and monotheism and psychological unification. And I really like that idea too, that, you know, that, that what you're trying to do, because you are a plurality, that, that's one of the things the psychoanalysts were really good at figuring out that the cognitive scientists haven't touched yet, as far as I can tell. They're way behind the psychoanalysts in that element of thinking, is that you are composed of sub-personalities, which all have their own desires and their own viewpoint, and their own thoughts and their own perceptions, and they're in a war with each other constantly. Maybe even a Darwinian war, it's been... It's been portrayed that way by certain neuroscientists and that that one of the goals of life is to integrate all of that plurality into a hierarchical ethical structure that has some canonical ethic at the pinnacle right we've talked a little bit about that and it's not obvious what should be at the pinnacle but we can guess at it it's it's that which we admire that's one way of thinking about it it's that that describes fair play across a sequence of games. That's another good way of thinking about it. It's, it's the heroic ideal. That's another way of thinking about it. But it's, it's combined with generosity. You know, because the hero, the mythological hero, goes out into the unknown and slays the dragon and gets the gold, but then comes back to the community and distributes what's found. And so it's courage plus generosity. And, um, and so all of, your, all of that interior struggling that you're doing is an attempt to bang yourself against the world with challenge constantly to hit everything together like you're beating on a piece of iron to 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 cure it let's say so that you don't you're not an internal contradiction you're not a massive competing god something like that because it's just too psychologically stressful and hard on everyone else and impossible for them to get along with you if you're one thing one moment and another thing another moment and so so anyways Abraham insists that Isaac find a wife from among people who are likely to carry off forward the monotheistic tradition and I'm not sure that the monotheistic tradition is actually indistinguishable is actually distinguishable from the individualistic tradition I think they might be the same thing at different levels of analysis, you know? So, because individual means undivided in some sense, right? To be an individual means to be one thing. And the other thing that mitigates against the idea of life as happiness is it isn't obvious to me that it's happiness that is what molds you and shapes you. You know, it's something more like optimal challenge, voluntarily undertaken. It's something like that, right? And I think that's echoed in the idea that everyone has a moral obligation to raise their cross, something like that, to accept the fact of their mortality voluntarily. I, I believe that that's the case. And I do actually think that that's a prerequisite to proper psychological development, because if you're not willing to take your mortality on voluntarily, like if you're kicking and fighting about it constantly, and you have every reason to, don't get me wrong, then you can't act forthrightly in the world, right? You're going to be afraid and when you're afraid, then you can't voluntarily take on a challenge. And then if you can't take, voluntarily take on a challenge, then you can't develop. And so, again, the life seems to be something like, if it's a proper life, is the voluntarily, voluntary taking on of great challenges. And maybe that's better than happiness. Like, it's certainly more noble, you know? It's not a word we use very much anymore, the idea of nobility, because we're so obsessed with happiness. But I think happiness is a... Like, if it comes along, man, great, you know, wonderful. Don't, don't take it lightly or for granted, because it's fleeting. But the idea that that's what you should be for, in some sense, just seems to me... If, if that's what life is for, then maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe that's correct, because that isn't what life is. But it also doesn't... It isn't obvious to me that that's what life should be. You know, I mean, if you really loved someone, like, like your son, let's say... Would you say, well, I hope he has a happy life? Or would you say, I hope he accomplishes great things? It seems to me that that's better, the, the accomplishing of great things. And because that's admirable, you know? 
It's like a happy person is a happy person, but a, a noble person is an admirable person. And, and that's, that's better, man. And so maybe there are better things than happiness. And so you can't judge being on the basis of the ratio of suffering to pleasure, something like that. It's, and I don't think we do that. I don't believe we do that. I mean, comedians are happy, right? But everyone doesn't aspire to be a comedian. And you don't watch comedy all the time, even though you, you can laugh nonstop, more or less, if the comedian's funny. You want to get your teeth into something. It also seems to me that, and this is one of the reasons I liked existential philosophy, was that, you know, the existentialists believed, it's sort of an original sin idea. They believed that we came into the world with an ethical burden already laden upon us, something like, something like that, and that we had a felt sense that it was necessary for us to justify our being. And that if we didn't do that, then we weren't authentic to ourselves. We weren't moving towards individuality. We weren't sustaining the community. We weren't living properly. And that and that, that idea was deeply embedded in people as part of their ordinary experience. And that also seems to me to be accurate. And, you know, I've dealt with lots of people, say, in my clinical practice, and they don't really cut, they, all, they will come and say, I wish I wasn't so unhappy. But they don't usually come and say, I wish I was happier. And those things aren't the same. And, and then when, when, when you talk to people who are having trouble, you know, they want to straighten things out and figure out how to do them right. It's something like that. And, and that, that's, the primary, that's their primary goal. And so anyways, Abraham sends his eldest servant off to his, the place that God has granted him to find a wife. And interestingly, it, the borders of the promised land are quite similar to the current borders of Israel. I mean, these are estimates, right, based on, on the biblical... And I, I mean, that's not a fluke, obviously, but it's, it's interesting to see the concordance between these ancient stories and the, and the present-day world. So, I thought that was very interesting, and it shows, once again, that the past... You think the past is the past, but it's not. It's, it's still here. It's embedded in the present, you know? Just like the future, in some, in some ways, is folded up inside the present, waiting to unfold... The past is all folded up inside the present, too. So, anyways, the servant goes to the land that he's been charged to go to, and, and he, he's, he's trying to figure out, how in the world am I going to find a good wife for Isaac? I mean, I don't know any of these people. And so he has this little dialogue that's presented in the form of a prayer, I suppose. Um, and he thinks, well, I'm going to go to the, the place where you water where people get water and water the animals and um because that's a place where everyone gathers so that's a good place to find someone and and it it's it's not a place of fun and lightness and relaxation and impulsivity it's a place of 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 life sustaining work and and he thinks something like well what would a decent girl do at a watering place and he thought well maybe she would offer a stranger some water and also offer to water the camels, because that would be brave to approach the stranger, and then generous, and then indicative of the, of the willingness to make an effort. And when you know that a camel, I think he took 10 camels, it was quite a few camels anyways, not just one, and that a camel can drink 20 gallons of water, and Rebecca, who was drawing water from the well, turns out to be Rebecca, was drawing water from the well, which was hard, right? Because water's heavy, and you have to lift it up, and it's 10 cal- camels, and so that's like 200 gallons of water. So, you know, she has to put herself out a fair bit in order to make this stranger happy, and so that's what happens. And then the servant has brought along gifts and that sort of thing, and anyways, to make a long story short, uh, Rebecca agrees to come back to come back with the servant and... Uh, Mary Isaac. And so, then she has, she gets pregnant and she has twins. And this is an interesting thing. The twins fight inside her. She can tell that, that they're not getting along. And this is an echo, right? It's an echo of Cain and Abel. And there, there's a mythological motif that the Jungians have called the hostile brothers, the hostile brothers. And you see them all the time. Batman and the Joker are hostile brothers, and Thor and Loki are hostile brothers. And it's an unbelievably common motif. And, uh, you know, the ultimate hostile brothers are Christ and Satan. So that's the, that's the archetypal representation of the hostile brothers. 
right? The ultimate good and the ultimate evil. And so, and so it's an echo of the Cain and Abel story, although it's a little more complex, I would say, from a literary point of view, because it isn't obvious which of these brothers is Cain and which of them is Abel. They have parts of both in each of them. So Esau, who turns out to be one of the brothers, and Jacob, who turns out to be the other, both have their admirable qualities and their faults. Anyways, um, Esau comes, is born first, but Jacob has him by the heel. And so there was a fight within the womb to see who would emerge first. Now, th- that's relevant because the firstborn had a special status, well, has a special status in many communities, especially agricultural communities, and there's a the re- reason all these, these people were more herds people, but if you divide your property equally among all your children, then in like three generations, everybody has one goat and everybody starves to death, you know, or the same thing happens with land. So one of the ways that, that traditional communities solve that is they just give almost everything to the firstborn. And then the, everyone else knows, well, you go out and do whatever you can. And it's kind of arbitrary and unfair, but, you know, at least it's predictably arbitrary and unfair instead of doom over four generations, you know. So it actually mattered to be the firstborn. And, and God generally favors the firstborn. And, and then you might think, well, what is it about being born first that's so relevant a, apart from the, the cultural practice of, of a more generous inheritance? And I would say, well, the firstborn is, is something like the model for the leader of the family, right? Because the firstborn child should be, if there's a number of siblings... A, should take care of the siblings, at least to some degree, but also should be a role model for them. So it's like a natural position of leadership. But there's a, psych- there's a psycholo- psychologization of the idea of the firstborn in these stories because God often passes over the firstborn in favor of a later-born child. Um, he seems to do that on the basis of moral character, essentially. And so there's this idea that, well, there's a natural proclivity towards leadership that's just a biological fact that would be associated with being a firstborn, but there's an element of characterological development that transcends that, and so that you, it's more important to be spiritually a firstborn, let's say, than to be biologically a firstborn, and God recognizes that continually in these stories and inverts the natural order and favors a laterborn who's who's done more work with regards to characterological development. And that's also interesting, too. You know, I've talked to lots of business people about leadership, and there's a literature on leadership, but it's not a good literature. It's, it's pretty shallow, um, partly because it's not that easy to define leadership, and partly because there are different... You know, you, people have different temperaments, and different temperaments can be leaders. They just do it in different ways. Now, there's something in common about being a leader, though, and I would say one is that if you're an actual leader, you actually know where you're going, right? Because what are you going to do, lead people in circles? It's like maybe they'll follow you, but you're not a leader. You're just a charlatan. So you have to know where you're going, and then you have to be able to communicate that, and then people have to trust you, so you actually have to be honest because people aren't that stupid, at least not for a long period of time. And then... Where you're going has to have some value, because otherwise, why would anyone want to go along with you? So, and then you might say, well, what, what are the attributes then that make you a leader? And I would say, well, they're characterological, fundamentally. And this is not naive optimism or, or, or casual moralizing. It has nothing to do with that. You know, we know, for example, that conscientiousness, the, the personality trait, is a good predictor of long-term success in, in most occupations, not all, but most, and that one of the things that's associated with conscientiousness is that people keep their word, they're trustworthy. And that's certainly one element of a leader, especially across any reasonable amount of time. You have to be able to trust the person. They can even be harsh, right? It doesn't matter, because you can see harsh leaders and kind leaders. But as long as they do what they say they will do, then, then you can follow them and you know that the future payoff is, is, is secure, something like that. So the idea that characterological development is more important to leadership than primogenitor, I think that's the right word, uh, primogenesis, anyways, being a firstborn, that's a very crucial psychological realization, that it's characterological development that makes you favored of God. You know, and I do think we've forgotten this in many ways because... There isn't a lot of emphasis in our education system on characterological development. And that's very, very surprising to me. I think maybe it's partly because in our fractured society, we can't agree on what constitutes 
a reasonable character, a logical goal. So we just throw up our hands and don't educate our kids to any degree at all, especially in schools, about what an admirable person is like, or even let them know that, well, maybe you should actually try to be one, you know, that that's actually the most important possible thing that you could learn, right? <laughs> so, and I also think, and I think this is laid out very thoroughly in the biblical stories as well, is that if there are enough people who are admirable, then things work, and if there aren't, then things Things are terrible. You get wiped out. You remember when Abraham is bargaining with God with regards to Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he asks God to save the city if there's like 40 admirable people, right? Respectable. But let's say admirable, right? I don't, want to, I don't want to say good because good is being corrupted in some sense by casual usage. I mean admirable, noble people, right? I think Abraham bargains God down to like 10. If there's 10 of them in the city, the city won't be destroyed. And that, that's not very many in a city. So there's an interesting idea there, which is that there, there doesn't have to be that many people in a group who have their act together. But zero is the wrong number. And if it's zero, then, then we're seriously in trouble. And I think that goes along with the idea of the Pareto principle in economics, too, which is that it's a small minority of people who do most of the productive work in any given domain. But so, so a small number of, of properly behaving people might have enough of an impact to keep everything moving, and that might, also, that might actually be true, but it can't fall below some crucial level. And I do think that we're in some danger of allowing it to fall below some crucial level because our society seems to be at war in some ways against the idea of the individual and individual character per se. And I think that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely catastrophic. And that's part of the reason that I'm doing these biblical lectures, you know, because I think that I've known for a long time that the moral presuppositions of a culture are instantiated in its stories. They're not instantiated in its explicit philosophy. There might be a layer of explicit philosophy, and, and of course there is in the West, and a layer of explicit law, but underneath that there are stories. And there isn't anything under the stories except maybe behavior. You know, and that's so implicit, it doesn't even actually count. It's not a cognitive operation. And so this is the story. These are the stories that are underneath our culture. And so there better be something to them. That's what we hope. And, but more importantly, maybe we shouldn't toss them away without knowing what they mean, because if we toss them away, then we're throwing everything that we depend on away, as far as I can tell, and we'll, we will pay for it. We'll pay for it individually, because we'll be weak. You know, because if you're not firm in your convictions, then someone else who's firm in their convictions, can, you're their puppet, like, instantly. And then you're also the puppet of your own doubts, right? Because unless you have convictions, you're going to generate doubts like mad, because everyone does, and then the doubts will win, and, and you'll be paralyzed, because there'll be, you know, 50% of you moving forward and 50% of you frozen stiff, and that'll be enough just to lodge you in place. And so... Okay, so there's a psychologization of the idea of leadership, which is very important, and then it's associated with the idea of characterological development, and it's associated with the idea of struggle, not happiness, and it's also associated with this Abrahamic idea, which I really liked, and, and which was something that's been very useful to me, as a consequence of doing these lectures, because remember at the beginning of the Abrahamic stories, Abraham's like a stay-at-home guy, right? He's like the guy who's 40 years old living in his, in his, in his mother's basement. And God says, like, get, get the hell out of there, you know? Get out in the world where you belong. Go do something difficult, because what you're doing isn't acceptable. And, you know, the first thing he does is go somewhere there's a terrible famine, and then he goes somewhere there's a tyranny. So, you know, it's, it's pretty funny. He follows God's call, and it's not like sweetness and light and paradise immediately. It's nothing like that. It's, it's instantaneous combat, you know, of, of the most difficult kind. So, but, but Abraham does, in fact, follow that impulse. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, too. I mean, I don't know. Here's another thing that made me a really an advocate of psychoanalytic thinking. And it, it, it was the sort of thing that started to terrify me about what the human psyche was actually like. I started to understand that not only were we like an amalgam of, of relatively autonomous sub-personalities, each of which had the possibility of gaining control, 
but that we were also victim, you might say, or beneficiary of impulses that were beyond our conscious formulation or, or, or understanding or capacity to resist. So one, here's, a, here's a funny story. So I was talking to one of my Patreon people online this week, and he said he's a, he was a committed atheist, and that's fine. You know, lots of atheists are very honest people, and they're atheists because they don't know how to reconcile what they know with traditional claims, let's say, and they're not willing to just mangle them together, you know. And there might be cynicism, all that associated with it as well. But he said he, was, he, said he was entranced by these biblical lectures, you know, which is pretty weird. And he said if someone would have told him a year ago that he was going to, like, be obsessed with a sequence of biblical lectures, he would have told them that they were mad. And so we had a bit of a discussion about that, because this is an interesting thing, you know. And he, he mentioned this. He said it, it was something like, you don't choose your interests, they choose you. And that's really worth thinking about too, man, because, you know, it's really hard to get interested in something you're not interested in, even if you know there's a good reason for it. You know, you're studying for an exam, you find the material boring, you know, anything will be more interesting than, than the studying. Even though you know that that's what you need to do, you can't voluntarily grab yourself by the scruff of the neck, let's say, and shake yourself and say, sit down and concentrate. Your mind will just go everywhere. But then if you're interested in something, and even if it's something you shouldn't be interested in, because that happens all the time, then it's like you're a laser focus, man. You can pay attention forever. You can work until you're exhausted. You won't even notice it. And you remember everything. It's like, okay, if you can't control your interest, what does? And man, I tell you, you can think about that for a very long time. So Jung talked about the spirit Mercurius. You know, Mercury is the winged messenger of the gods. And, and here's how he conceptualized it psychologically. He thought this is what the, the ancient people who thought about Mercury as the winged messenger of the gods were trying to state psychologically. You know, your, your interest flits around. It's like there's something that captures it and that moves your interest from place to place. You know, like if you walk into a bookstore, you'll get interested in a particular book. And it's as if the book grips you. Because you don't know why you're interested in that. You might, but often you don't know why you're interested in that book. And, you know, your interest is flitting around. And so that's Mercury. The thing that makes your interest flick, flicker around is Mercury, the winged messenger of the gods. And Mercury is the messenger of the gods because it's the things behind the scenes psychologically that are manipulating your attention. And for Jung, those were equivalent in some sense to the lost gods. And so for Jung, your, your interest was being manipulated behind the scenes by unseen forces that were associated with your characterological development across time. That was the manifestation of the self. So the self is this, the, the potential you, let's say. And the way it operates in the present is by gripping your interest and directing it somewhere. And that's part of the instinct of self-realization. It's a mind-boggling idea, man, really. It's, I think it's correct. I, I can't see how it can't be correct. It doesn't mean I understand it completely, but... It certainly seems phenomenologically correct, and I mean, the potential that you are has to manifest itself somehow in, in the here and now. It has to. And what better way than by directing your attention? You know, it's like, it seems like this might be useful for you, or maybe you get attracted to this person, or maybe you admire this person. That happens with kids a lot. They'll admire someone and then copy them. And you can see that that's obviously part of their developmental progression. Right? It's a form of hero worship, but kids are very imitative, and they hero worship at the drop of a hat. And so they're, they're entranced by the, the next stage of development, and if they see someone who embodies that, especially if it's in the zone of proximal development, it's, it's, some, it's something they could achieve, stretching a bit. They find someone who embodies that next stage of development, and then they start to imitate them and act like them. Well, we're, adults are no different. We're no different. We're just, we do it at a perhaps more abstract and sophisticated level. So, okay, so Jacob and Esau are, are hostile brothers. They're, they're like Cain and Abel, except the mixture of Cain and Abel, and they're very different. Esau was red and covered with hair. He was a hunter and a man of the field. So he's like your basic jock, right? He's extroverted, he's outgoing, he's really tough. He's like extraordinarily masculine. He hunts, uh, and he's a real favorite of his father. And so, and, and Jacob, isn't. He's a dweller in tents. And, um, yeah, right, exactly. Exactly, exactly, right. And it says Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, that's a problem, right? That, that's a big problem. And that, there's a Freudian element to this. It's like, this family is now divided because 
one child is the favorite of the mother, and that's Jacob, and one child is the favorite of the father. And so Jacob is kind of a, a mother's boy, I guess to use an ar- a rather archaic phrase, and certainly not as admirable from his father's perspective as Esau, who's a tough guy who goes out with a bow and arrow and like, you know, wanders around in the plains and brings animals home, and, and he's tough. He's a tough guy. So, and, but, but there's this discord in the family because one parent prefers one child and the other parent prefers the other. And it's obvious from the story that the parents do not communicate about this because they really take sides. And so there's a split in the family. And that's, I think, very realistic because one of the things that you do learn if you have a family, and of course most of you do, but if you also think about families is that there's, there's deep divisions within families very, very frequently that no one will ever talk about. And, or even think about often, because it's too painful to think about, you know. And Freud himself said, Freud was clearly his mother's favorite. And the family sacrificed a lot, including some of the potential ambitions of the other children, in order to kind of put Sigmund Freud up on a pedestal and, and advance his education. And it worked. I mean, you know, he, he, he turned into a great man, but there was a cost to his siblings. And Freud himself said that there was something about being the favorite of the mother that gave a person additional confidence throughout their life. And, you know, there's, there's something to be said about that. Even someone like Eric Erickson, you know, he noted that, very interested in child development, that that first bonding with the mother was the, was the place where trust was established. Maybe trust even in the goodness of existence was established. And so, anyways, Jacob is Rachel's favorite. And uh, Esau is Isaac's favorite. Now, Esau being extroverted, let's say, is also a bit impulsive, and maybe he's not, he's a man of action, he's not a forward thinker, and, but he's also doing hard work, and so, you know, he goes out, and he's hunting, and he's worn out, and he comes home, and he's faint with hunger, and uh, huh, Jacob is at home cooking, he's boiling up lentils, red lentils, and, um, you know, Esau comes in from the hunt, and he's like half starved to death, and he's sitting there, and the aroma of these red lentils reaches him, and He's exhausted, and, and, and he tells Jacob that he wants some of this stew. And Jacob, who's being a pain in the neck, fundamentally, basically says, no, there's a, there's a teasing thing going on here, and, and won't give him any. And, and, and there's, you have to imagine this, because it's not laid out explicitly in the story, but there's some dispute about whether Esau gets to have lunch, and... Jacob finally says, well, I'll give you some, but you have to, you have to give me your birthright. And uh, you, you, Esau, you think, he must say something like, you know, well, to hell with it. Take it, you know, you, you son of a bitch. Take it. Just give me some damn stew. It's something like that. So that's what happens. But, you know, with these archaic people, once you made a statement like that, that was, you were done. That was it. And so um, Esau sells his birthright. And this turns out to be incredibly significant. Um, Benson, who wrote biblical commentary, said, oh, huh, there's a bit of a twist to it. So Esau eats the, the red lentils, and then from then on, his name is Red. And you've got to use your imagination a bit. I mean, he, people are making fun of him, right? That's why they're calling him Red. I mean, he's already Red, because we, we, we established that. But no one was calling him Red before this. And so for the rest of his life... You know, every time he goes out amongst his friends and family, they call him Red and sort of snicker because he's the, you know, half-famished idiot who sold his birthright for a bowl of lentils. And so it's, it's, not, it's not that funny, actually. And so Esau is not happy about this. And, and it actually turns out that this... So what does it mean? It means don't sell the future for the desires of the present and don't be casual about what you have. And then there's an archetypal element to this too. And Benson says, various have been the opinions what this birthright was which Esau sold. But the most probable is that together with the right of sacrificing, so determining what should be sacrificed and when, and being the priest of the family... It included the peculiar blessing promised to the seed of Abraham, that of being the progenitor of the Messiah and the heir of the special promises of God respecting Christ's kingdom. It was at least typical of spiritual privileges, those of the firstborn that are written in heaven. Well, that's a lot harsher than meets the eye to begin with. And so there's a very interesting, deep, 
moral story there, which is, it's sort of, Esau does the opposite of a sacrifice. It's the reverse, right? He sacrifices the future for the present. And so the, the, the story basically says, the way it's laid out across stories, is that if you're the sort of person that sacrifices the future to the present, then that eradicates the possibility that you will bring the, the most noble being into existence. That's what it means. And you can, again, this is the psychological significance of the biblical story. So that's a bad thing to do if you want to realize your potential, let's say. You don't do reverse sacrifices. That's a very bad idea. And so Esau really did himself in by being too attached to the present without a vision of the future. So he's too in the moment, you know. And, and he pays a heavy price for it. I mean, he's the, he's the, first of all, he loses his birthright and, and his double inheritance. So there's a practical consequence. And then there's a spiritual consequence. And then he's, well, he's been made a fool of by his brother. Jacob means... Uh, Supplanter, by the way. That's what the name means. And Jacob is always trying to usurp Esau, as, as we see it. And so Jacob gets one over on him. And, you know, that's not doesn't make an older brother happy when a younger brother gets something over on him, that's for sure. And then he loses the opportunity to be the progenitor of the Messiah, which is like, he probably didn't realize that precisely. But it seems to be, you know, it's kind of rough, that. So, and then there's, there's a statement in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's an echo of the same idea. You know, and you think, well, what does this idea of soul mean? And it's not intellect. And it's, it's, something like, it's something like consciousness allied with character, I think. And I think the reason that it's valued so much is that because you've got to ask yourself, well, what do you really have when it comes down to it? So life is suffering, let's say, and, you know, you can, you can pile up worldly goods. And the God in the Old Testament doesn't seem to have anything against that, really, right? The people who he favors seem to prosper quite nicely in the world. But they also have to make a choice between whether they're going to fundamentally sustain their character or whether they're going to prosper in the world when push comes to shove. And the idea constantly is that really what you have in the world that allows you the best possible defense against the suffering that's intrinsic to being is your character. That's what you have, period. And I don't think there is anything that's more psychologically true than that. You know, because everything else... Well, first of all, your relationships with others depend on your character. And certainly, this is part of the story of Noah's Ark, you know, because his generations were perfect, so he had a very tight familial... Uh, uh, arrangement, everyone trusted each other, that's a big deal if you hit a rocky patch in your life, right? And it's character that, it's character that determines that. You know, if you're generous and honest and all of those things, and people know they can rely on you, assuming they're not resentful, that's a whole different story, then they're going to come to your aid when, when it's necessary. They're going to pull together with you. And, you know, when people are really after you for one reason or another, and they're accusing you of all sorts of things, and you're guilty because you've you have a past that's laden with characterological errors, then it's very easy for people to take you down because they'll poke until they hit a place where you're guilty and then you're done because you'll do yourself in with your own judgment. And so, well, so Esau makes a very big mistake. And there's a sacrificial idea here too, which is, you know, now and then you're going to be faced with a situation where it's something you really want or your character. Maybe you'll have to lie about something, you know? And you'll think, ah, what difference does it make? You know, I'll lie about it. Jacob does this. But the problem, there's a bunch of problems with that. One is that, well, now you know that you're the sort of person that will, in fact, deceive yourself about the nature of reality if something shiny is dangled in front of you. And that's not good because it undermines your faith in yourself. And when you're really in trouble, they call that the dark night of the soul. When you're really in trouble, that's what you've got. You've got whether or not you can trust yourself, and that's it, you know, when things are really harsh. And so if you've betrayed yourself in that manner, then you weaken yourself under the worst possible circumstances. And that's just, that's really not a good thing. So this is very practical advice. Um, it's not casual moralizing. There's very little casual moralizing in these stories. In the next part of the story, there's some parallels with Abraham. And, and that's built into the narrative, I think, because Isaac is... Um, Abraham's descendant, and so we have to keep the narrative echoing forward, otherwise it loses its, its continuity. And 
Um, there's a famine in the land that Isaac's in. And God tells him to stay the course anyways. Repeating the promise he, he gave to Abraham, although Isaac goes to Abimelech, also telling the king and people that Rebekah was his sister, which is exactly what Abraham did when he went to Egypt. And so there's another echo there of the same... Of the same it's, it's as if the story is being told for a second time, essentially. And that's supposed to remind you of the, of the previous story. But they're careless. The king sees that Rebekah and Isaac are intimate together. And um, luckily, he doesn't have them put to death. He just tells everybody in the kingdom that they're to be left the hell alone. And then Isaac prospers in that land, just like Abraham did in Egypt until the Philistines ask him to leave. He's just getting too rich and powerful. Things are going too well for him, so he's asked to, he's asked to leave. Now, in the meantime, Esau gets married. And I, this is a funny little story. He says, he marries two women who give grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So they, whoever Esau marries, they're not popular with, his, with their in-laws, not in the least. That actually becomes relevant a little later because they drive Rebecca quite mad. So I get a kick out of that because that's very common, you know. It's not easy to integrate new people into your family and, and hope that that will go smoothly. It's actually one of the real catastrophes in life, right? You have a kid and maybe you get along with them and maybe you don't. Uh, but let's assume you do, but then they marry someone that you just don't like, and, or maybe you think is wrong for them. I mean, that's really rough. That's, what are you going to do about that? You know, because you're, you're basically screwed both ways. If you have the person you love around, then you have to put up with this horrendous creature that they allied themselves with. And if you, if you get rid of them completely, well, then, you know, you don't have your child anymore. So it's a very, very difficult position. And so that's another example of the realism, I think, of the stories. Now, Isaac, who's hypothetically on his deathbed, asks Esau, to hunt for venison, because he likes venison, and he's happy that his son is a hunter. And Rebecca overhears this, and so she conspires with Jacob um, to, to slaughter two small goats and make his father some stew, because he wants Esau to make him stew out of venison. But Rebecca, who's being, I would say, let's say slightly deceitful or horribly lying, that would be more accurate, um, she conspires with Jacob, so Jacob kills two little goats, kids, and boils up a stew, and then he puts on some uh, uh, goat skins, because Esau is a hairy character, and, and Rebekah dresses Isaac in um, Esau's clothing, because Isaac can't see very well at this point, and so then Jacob goes into his father with the stew, and um, he's trying to disguise his voice, but it doesn't work very well, and so uh, Isaac asks him to come close, and Jacob puts out his arm with the goat skin on it, and, and Isaac smells him too, and he smells like Esau, and, um, which maybe wasn't the best thing, but, um, and feels like him. And, and so, uh, because Isaac thinks he's on his deathbed, um, he decides to deliver a blessing to, hypothetically, to Esau. And so, but it's Jacob. And so that's a big deal too, because the blessing is actually... As I said before, with these ancient people, it appeared as though once you said something, you didn't get to take it back. You couldn't say, well, look, you've, you've deceived me, so it doesn't count. It was like, I, they weren't maybe as, as, well, weak might be one way of thinking about it, but another way is they, they weren't quite as attentive to context, you know, because if I make you a deal and then it turns out that you've betrayed me, I may feel that the deal is no longer valid because... The assumption was you were being honest to begin with, and that, you know, violates the whole spirit. But that isn't how these people thought. They said, once you promised, man, you promised, and that was that. So Isaac blesses Jacob. He says, let God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over thy brethren. That's going to be rough on Esau. Let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And so there's a, quite a remarkable painting of that. So there's Rebecca. She's looking pretty old. And Isaac's looking pretty blind. And Jacob's taking directions from his mother. And we might say he's perhaps a little old to be taking moral lessons from his mother, especially given how she's acting. And so it's a pretty ugly scene altogether, especially that we also know that Jacob already tricked Esau out of his birthright. And so now he's like taken the birthright and he's taken the blessing. And so... 
as I said, that Jacob, he turns out to be the father of Israel. It's like, he's a reprehensible character. These are major league betrayals that he's engaging in. It's not trivial. He really, really pulls the rug out from under his brother. And, you know, you could say, well, Esau is not as awake as he might be. You know, he's kind of a wild man. And fair enough. But it certainly seems to me that the, the predominant moral error falls on Jacob's shoulders. It's very treacherous behavior, what he's doing. So then Esau shows up, and he's got a nice stag for his dad, and it's like a little late for that. And he states that his brother was rightly named Jacob, which means supplanter, because he's been deceived twice. And Isaac says, Isaac answered, he's, he's asking, fun, uh, Esau is asking fundamentally if there's anything at all left over for him. And Isaac can't give him the same blessing because that's already been given, so he has to think of something else. And um, Isaac says, Behold, I, I've made him thy Lord, and all his brothers I've given to him for servants, which includes you. And with corn and wine have I sustained him, and what shall I now do unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Have, have you even one blessing for me, my father? And Bless me also. And, and Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And, you know, we already know that Esau is a pretty tough guy, by all appearances. And, you know, he's out there hunting on his own and camping, and it's like he's no pushover. And the fact that this reduces him to tears is an indication of the magnitude of the betrayal. And Isaac says, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword thou shalt live, and thou shalt serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you will have the dominion, and you'll break the yoke, his yoke off from thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. So fundamentally, you know, if Isaac dies or when he dies, then we'll mourn for him and then Jacob better look the hell out because it's like, it's, it's serious death coming his way. And, you know, he's got a, he's got a point. He's, in, in Dante's Inferno, I think I mentioned this at one point, so Dante's Inferno is a very interesting story. It's a descent into hell, eh? And it's, it's actually one of the places that we sort of derive a, the popular conception of hell was partly based on Dante's, on Dante's imagination, on his work. And what Dante was trying to do was to discover the hierarchical structure of evil. And, you know, you might think there's a hierarchical structure of good. Some things are better than other things. But there's also a hierarchical structure of evil. Some evils are greater than other evils. And he put betrayal in the, in the, in the lowest part of hell. Right? So if you were betraying people, you were right beside Satan himself. And so, and I think that's good. That's very smart. Well, Dante was a genius, after all. Um, and I think the reason for that is that, you see, if someone trusts you, they're laying their vulnerability open to you. Now, they might just be naive, let's say, and that's, we won't think about that because you're just a child if you're naive. You can still be betrayed. But if you're an adult and you trust, it's often because you, if you're an actual adult, it's you willingly open yourself up, knowing that you could be hurt, right? Because you're not naive anymore. So you decide to trust and you say, I'll open myself up. And I know that I'm laying myself open to you if you choose to use that power. And then that's a good thing to know, you know, if you've been hurt as a child or hurt as a naive person, you might say, well, why should I ever trust again? Which is a really good question. And the answer is, the reason you trust again once you're an adult is because you're courageous. You're, you're courageous. It's an act of courage to trust. And the reason it's useful is because if you trust someone, you open the door to reciprocity and negotiation and cooperation, and you entice the best part of the person forward. And so it's a, it's a courageous act. But then if you betray someone, then what you've done is you've taken the best part of them, which is the part that will courageously trust, you know, with open eyes, right? And you've stuck a dagger in that. And so you've purposefully damaged the best part of them. And so that's why it's such an egregious fault. And, and it's often people don't recover from that sort of thing. You, if you betray someone badly enough, you can... You can damage them, like you can give them post-traumatic stress disorder if you, really, if you really put your mind to it. And, you know, that's not just a psychological disorder. If you have post-traumatic stress disorder, it produces permanent neurological alterations that make you more neurotic, more sensitive to negative emotion, really, for the rest of your life. Like, you can, you can recover from it to some degree, but stress will tend to re-instantiate the PTSD. So... 
you, you hurt someone, and it's not merely, psycho, not, not that psychological is merely, but it's not merely psychological, right? It's, it's fundamental physiological damage. So, anyways, Jacob's smart enough to get out of there. And, which is also not really a testament to his integrity, right? I mean, he's done these terrible things at the behest of his mother because he wants power, and, and he wants to get it without deserving it, and then, you know, he finally goes too far and he hightails it out of there to, his, to another family member, to his mother's brother. And so, it's not exactly the world's most heroic story, that's for sure. And so, now there's an interlude here, and this is a really interesting interlude. It's, it's the story of Jacob's ladder. So he's off to visit Laban, or Laban, who's uh, his, his mother's brother. And on the way, he, he, he has a sleep. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows, which seems to indicate very bad planning on, on his part. And and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and beheld a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and beheld the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. And so, this story of Jacob's ladder has really possessed the imagination of the West. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's an archetypal story. Because the idea of a ladder that reaches to heaven is one of the oldest ideas of mankind. So you find it widely distributed among the shamanic cultures, for example. And it's a hallmark of psychedelic experience. That's another way of thinking about it. Which is a very peculiar thing. So there's one representation of of the ladder. You see God up at the top there. um, Peeking out from the clouds. Now, you know, that's sort of where we get the idea that God is... In, in heaven, and then heaven's up in the sky. And, and that's an easy story to make fun of because, you know, we've gone up to the moon and there's no God there. And, and, but but this, this is not a reasonable way of conceptualizing what these experiences are about. These experiences, what this is, the opening up there, that's more like an opening into an, an alternate dimension. That's a better way of thinking about it. It's beyond, like, from, from the Judeo-Christian perspective, one of the things you have to understand is that God is beyond space and time. He's not in the universe. He's outside the universe in some manner. And so the idea that, that you have an experience of God and it's up isn't... The up is the best that the human imagination can do with what's essentially a form of extra-dimensional experience. Or, or that's the, the best way to conceptualize it. And these experiences aren't rare. You know, they, they, make, the, they make up the core of, of the shamanic tradition. And so there's an intrusion of the ancient shamanic tradition, which is tens of thousands of years old, into the biblical stories at this point. Now, why Jacob had an essentially shamanic experience is very difficult to tell, because we don't know what these old people were up to, right? And we don't know how much of the archaic tradition, archaic religious tradition, was still extant at that, pers- at that point in time. But we certainly do know that our ancient forebears um, were using psychedelic substances constantly, like Amanita muscaria mushrooms, for example, which were widely used in India before they became extinct. That's the theory, anyways. Uh, that seemed to be the basis of the chemical soma, which uh, much has been written about. And so, we hear of this as a dream, or as a vision, and perhaps that's what it was, but perhaps that wasn't what it was either, and perhaps it was um, an experience that was induced by, by, by the same processes that shamanic people have always induced these experiences. And so we're going to go through this a little bit. So anyways, there's a, there's a connection between heaven and earth that opens up. That's, that's, that's the, that's the uh, vision. And there's messengers moving up and down. Now, one way you can conceptualize that is psychologically, as we already discussed, that you know, there, there are forces within you that are active and alive, and you can think of them in some sense as messengers of the higher self, and so you could think about this as an image of a psychological reality. But, and so we can stick with that, but, but here's some of the representations that have been made. I really like the one on the right. Uh, that's William Blake. I like the, uh, the helix idea, and I don't think that that's 
That's fluke. There are helixes and double helixes and all sorts of imagery, imagery, very ancient and very modern, that are associated with both healing and with this kind of vision. So, and you see in, in the Blake representation, God is associated with, well, really with the sun and with light. And, and you see that on the left as well, that wherever God is is where light is. And so that's a very interesting idea as far as I'm concerned as well. There's some other representations. One by 